during the attack in a different direction to Haimong, Smith's Unified Marine Army Rock Units fought 14 divisions from four CCF Army groups and inflicted 38,000 casualties. Since landing at Wonsan, the Marines had suffered 4,400 battle casualties, including 718 dead, 192 missing, and hundreds of cases of untreated frostbite. They left nothing behind but a battlefield strewn with Chinese corpses and useless equipment. By December 10, 1950, Marines were the only American division north of the 38th parallel with the capability and will to fight. Smith began withdrawing through Hungnam only after receiving direct orders from MacArthur. On that day, Admiral Doyle's task force began embarking 105,000 U.S. and ROC troops, 91,000 civilians, and 350,000 tons of supplies. The evacuation took two weeks. Relieved to see the Leathernecks go, the Chinese did not interfere. The 8th Army succeeded in escaping south, but it had still not found a line it could defend when General Walton Walker riding at high speed in his command jeep to inspect positions north of Seoul on December 23, 1950, was killed when it collided with a civilian truck. Command of the 8th Army was given to Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgway. Matthew Ridgway was born March 3, 1895, in Fort Monroe, Virginia, to Colonel Thomas Ridgway, an artillery officer, and Ruth Ridgway. He grew up as an army brat, a term that he embraced with pride. He later remarked that his earliest memories are of guns and marching men, of rising to the sound of the Reveille gun and lying down to sleep at night while the sweet sad notes of taps brought the day officially to an end. At West Point, he served as a manager of the football team in 1917, he was commissioned a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. He was disappointed that he was not assigned to combat duty in World War I, feeling that the soldier who had had no share in this last great victory of good over evil would be ruined. Shortly after the outbreak of World War II in Europe in September 1939, he was assigned to the War Plans Division. In August 1942, Ridgway was promoted to Major General and was given command of the U.S. 82nd Airborne Division upon Omar N. Bradley's assignment to the 28th Infantry Division. The 82nd, having already established a combat record in World War I, had earlier been chosen to become one of the Army's five new airborne divisions. The conversion of an entire infantry division to airborne status was an unprecedented step for the U.S. Army and required many hours of training, testing, and experimentation. Ridgway helped plan the airborne invasion of Sicily in July 1943 and commanded the 82nd in combat there. In 1944, Ridgway helped plan the airborne operations in Operation Overlord. In the Normandy operations, he jumped with his troops, who fought for 33 days in advancing to saint sauveur near Cherbourg, in the middle of the Cotentin Peninsula. In September 1944, Ridgway was given the command of the 18th Airborne Corps and later helped push back German troops during the Battle of the Bulge. In March 1945, he led his troops into Germany during Operation Varsity and was wounded in the shoulder by German grenade fragments on March 24, 1945. At war's end, Ridgway was on a plane headed for a new assignment in the Pacific Theater under General of the Army Douglas MacArthur, with whom he had served while a captain at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Ridgway had a strong and dynamic personality. Both proved invaluable for the task ahead.
When Ridgway took command, the army was still in a tactical retreat. Ridgway's success in turning 8th Army's morale around, using little more than a magnetic personality and bold leadership, is still a model for the army for how the power of leadership can dramatically change a situation. Perhaps another reason he was chosen was because Ridgway was not phased by the Olympian demeanor of General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur, in turn, gave Ridgway latitude in operations he had not given his predecessor. After Ridgway landed in Tokyo on Christmas Day, 1950, to discuss the operational situation with MacArthur, the latter assured his new commander that the actions of the 8th Army were his to conduct as he saw fit. Ridgway was encouraged to retire to successive defensive positions, as was currently underway, and hold Seoul as long as he could, but not if doing so meant that 8th Army would be isolated in an enclave around the city. In a foreshadowing of his aggressive nature, Ridgway asked specifically that if he found the combat situation to my liking, whether MacArthur would have any objection to my attacking. MacArthur answered, Eighth Army is yours, Matt. Do what you think best. The Communists did not give Ridgway long to establish himself in his new command. On January 1, 1951, the CCF launched a 500,000-man offensive against Allied forces along the 38th parallel. Three days later, they recaptured Seoul. After successfully moving his army south, Ridgway began the task of restoring his soldiers' confidence in themselves. To accomplish this, he aggressively went about finding other leaders in 8th Army who were not defeatists or defensive-oriented, despite the hard knocks of November and December, and put them in charge. He was quick to reward commanders who shared his sentiments, and just as quick to relieve those officers at any level who did not. For example, during one of his first briefings in Korea at i -Corps, Ridgway sat through an extensive discussion of various defensive plans and contingencies. At the end, he asked the startled staff about the status of their attack plans. The Corps G3 operations officer responded that he had no such plans. Within days, i -Corps had a new G3, and the message went out, Ridgway was interested in taking the offensive. He also replaced officers who did not send out patrols to fix enemy locations and removed enemy positions from commander's planning maps if local units had not been in contact recently. All these positive leadership steps had a dramatic effect immediately. Eighth Army was in Korea to stay. When Ridgway took command, he placed the 1st Marine Division in reserve. With no more amphibious operations planned, Ridgway incorporated Marine Air Units into the USAF. Like it or not, the Marines found themselves shackled to the Army and Air Force in a war of attrition. The situation changed little until February 24, when the commander of the 9th Army Corps died of a heart attack. Ridgway put General Oliver P. Smith in charge of the Corps, and General Puller assumed command of the 1st Marine Division. Smith was born in Menard, Texas, but grew up in Northern California. He went through the Reserve Officer Training Corps program at the University of California, Berkeley, and was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1917. During the First World War, he was ordered to Guam followed by shipboard duty, then Washington, D.C., three years in Haiti, and the Army's field officer school at Fort Benning in 1931. Subsequently, Smith taught at Marine Corps schools in Quantico, following which he became the first Marine officer to matriculate at the French École de Guerre. Returning to the United States, he was again assigned as an instructor at Quantico, where, because of his obvious intellectual power, he acquired the nicknames The Professor and The Student General. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Smith was ordered to Headquarters Marine Corps, Washington, D.C., 
where he became executive officer of the Division of Plans and Policies. He remained in this capacity until January 1944, when he joined the 1st Marine Division on New Britain. There, he took command of the 5th Marine Regiment and subsequently led the regiment in the Talesia phase of the Cape Gloucester operation. In April 1944, he was named Assistant Division Commander of the 1st Marine Division and participated in operations against the Japanese in the Peleliu operation during September and October 1944. Smith became Marine Deputy Chief of Staff of the 10th Army in November 1944 and participated in the Battle of Okinawa from April through June 1945. In July 1945, he returned to the United States and became Commandant of the Marine Corps Schools, Quantico. In March of 1948, he became Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps and Chief of Staff, Headquarters Marine Corps, Washington, D.C. While there, he served as Editor-in-Chief of the Professional Journal of U.S. Marines, the Marine Corps Gazette. Smith was not a colorful character, a practicing Christian scientist, he did not drink, and he did not use profanity. In fact, when he spoke at all, he rarely raised his voice above a normal speaking level. Consequently, when in spring 1950, Smith received orders as Commanding General, 1st Marine Division, there was not a little heartburn among other Marine General officers, which only intensified when that division deployed to Korea. Yet if ever there was an officer with the right qualifications, at the right place, at the right time, it was Major General Oliver Prince Smith. It was Smith who worked closely and effectively with Rear Admiral James H. Doyle on a very short timeline to plan the September 1950 landing at Incheon. Like Doyle, Smith was a practical-minded, hard-headed professional who cared not a whit for high-blown rhetoric or elegant maps, only for getting the job done. It was Smith who wisely resisted great pressure from his corps commander to accelerate his division's advance on Seoul in order to meet an artificial schedule for securing that city, urgings to make a dangerous night attack once in Seoul, and attempts to interfere in his division's internal chain of command. Smith was neither good news material nor well known outside marine circles. He was a very private and modest person. In Korea, he was easily eclipsed by the colorful Chesty Puller. Born in 1898, Lewis Puller grew up in Virginia on tales of courage in the name of freedom. Grandson of a Confederate cavalryman who fought with Jeb Stuart and died at Kelly's Ford, Lewis and his brother Sam were raised on the stories of Civil War veterans. At the age of 19, Lewis Puller entered VMI and began his own military career when America entered World War I, the nation was so ill-prepared that rifles were commandeered from VMI and other military schools for use in combat. Lewis uh, Puller uh, went to the authorities at VMI with the very reasonable and logical uh, uh, thought that, well, if they need rifles, they're going to need people to shoot them, and I want to be there for that job. He had been at VMI only a year. He was too young to get an Army commission, but he knew that the Marines would take him immediately. So on June 27, 1918, the day after his 20th birthday, he enlisted in the Marine Corps. Lewis Puller headed for boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. From his first day at Paris Island, Puller stood out among the new recruits as a natural soldier. One drill instructor said of Puller, I bet that guy even sleeps at attention. But he recognized the young man's gift for leadership and even gave him a platoon to train in squad movements. He had them in shape within a week. 
In the words of his first sergeant, he was the perfect drill instructor. No one was surprised when Puller was among the 5% of his class chosen for training as a drill instructor. Puller trained hard for combat in France, hoping to join the Marines fighting a Chateau theory. He almost made it. His battalion was packing for transit to France when Armistice Day canceled the orders. Despite all his best efforts, Louis Puller's first war ended before he could get to the front. With no Kaiser to fight, the Marines looked closer to home for their next front to fight. They found it in the unsteady regimes of Central America and the Caribbean. The Marines served as America's colonial troops, fighting guerrillas, keeping order, and propping up tottering regimes. Because United Fruit was partially running these small agricultural countries, the conflicts there were called the Banana Wars. Puller embraced these actions as his personal training exercise. In the sweat-drenched, mosquito-infested tropics, Lewis Puller learned the rules of guerrilla warfare and the importance of leadership in the thick of battle. Puller's willingness to risk his own life with the troops he commanded soon became the stuff of legend. Still in his 20s, Lewis Puller found himself becoming larger than life. Soon he was known throughout the Marine Corps as Chesty. One look at Puller and you know where the name Chesty came from. He had a barrel chest and it was very obvious. He had very long legs and a very short upper body, but his chest stuck out like a barrel. And uh, so somebody started calling him Chesty and uh, I guess it just stuck. Over a seven month period in 1930, Puller led five successive engagements against superior forces routing the enemy every time. His headlong bravery earned him a Navy Cross. On December 7, 1941, Chesty was home on leave. In the stunning moments after the news of the attack broke, his first thoughts were of the men he left behind. Why don't they say something about the Marines in China, he growled. Overnight, it seemed the country caught up with Chesty Puller. Japan's treachery galvanized the country for war. The country just seemed to come together everywhere you went. It was just a good old USA, good old USA, we'll fight him, we'll fight him. When it was time to strike back, U.S. planners had singled out a tiny Japanese-held island in the Solomons for the first American offensive of the war. Its name was Guadalcanal. Chesty's Marines were given the job of wrestling it away from the battle-hardened Japanese defenders. Major Lewis Puller was finally going to war for his country. The long and bloody campaign on Guadalcanal began on August 7, 1942, eight months to the day after Pearl Harbor. The amphibious landing surprised the Japanese. By the time they finally realized the island had been invaded, 24 hours had passed, and more than 11,000 Marines had landed. When we landed on the island, the Japanese had the upper hand as far as, uh, not in numbers, but in control of the, uh, the, the surrounding waters. Right at the front of the action was the legendary Chesty Puller. He fought like a man with no fear, always on the front line beside his men, and he expected his officers to do the same. Father told me once, if you did your duty, you didn't have to worry about being scared. Soon after arriving on Guadalcanal, Puller led his battalion in a fierce action along the Matanico, in which Puller's quick thinking saved three of his companies from annihilation. In the action, Three of Puller's companies were surrounded and cut off by a larger Japanese force. Puller ran to the shore, signaled a United States Navy destroyer, and then directed the destroyer to provide fire support while landing craft rescued his Marines from their precarious position, actions that earned him a bronze star. In a firefight on the night of October 24, 25, 1942, lasting about three hours, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines killed more than 1,400 Japanese. 
For his tireless devotion to duty and his cool judgment under fire against superior forces, Puller won his third Navy Cross. Puller was up in the front lines, essentially here with us, and whenever actions we had, we turned around and and there was Puller. On December 26, 1943, the 1st Marine Division once again stormed ashore against a determined enemy. This time at Cape Gloucester near New Guinea, commanding the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, Puller led an advance against an airfield. Days later, he took charge of another battalion after its officers were wounded. Under constant enemy fire and torrential rain, Puller's Marines slugged through a three-week campaign against entrenched Japanese forces. Like a man incapable of fear, Chesty moved from company to company in the front lines along a fire-swept ridge. This was adrenaline, opportunity, liquor, whatever. I mean, this, he really, really liked being a troop leader. His forceful leadership and gallant spirit earned him a fourth Navy Cross. No other Marine had ever been so honored. Chesty Puller's next target was Peleliu, an island halfway between New Guinea and the Philippines. The island was surrounded by coral reefs and mango trees, but its dominant feature was a long, steep ridge with caves that offered natural pillboxes to the Japanese defenders. Puller's Marines had the invasion's toughest assignment, take that ridge. Every tree on that place had been stripped. There was nothing but a great chalky coral wasteland. Temperature 120. You must understand that Peleliu had been fortified for many, many years. Dug in, concreted, reinforced, underground railroads, everything. The Marines were on top of the ground and the Japanese were under the ground and that made tough fighting. Two weeks into the battle, half of Puller's regiment was gone. His plea for more men was answered with grim truth. There were no more reinforcements to send. As the battle raged on, a young lieutenant was sent to find Puller. Everyone he asked pointed him forward toward the fighting. So I kept going and going, and pretty soon I was crawling because it was bullets and machine guns, and, and he's up there. And this is Puller, Puller perfectly. The man was up there. Not running the thing, but up there where he could maneuver and where he could bring in the artillery and where he could support the troops. Beautiful, beautiful. In nine days of continuous fighting, Chesty's troops killed nearly 4,000 Japanese soldiers, but at a terrible cost. More than half of his first Marines were dead or wounded. No Marine regiment in history ever lost so many in a single battle. A standing order from the commanding general was to uh, move, maintain the momentum at all costs. That was the order. And that's what Fuller did. Chesty was ordered back to the United States to train Marines for this final terrible battle of the war. Once again, Chesty Puller was preparing to follow the guns into battle. But once again, a world war ended with Chesty Puller waiting at home. In the rubble of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many saw the end of Chesty Puller's style of warfare. But Chesty was not ready for the junk heap.